You're listening to the Deerfield Public Library podcast, May 10th, 2023. From include everything, then I get to question everything. Welcome to the Deerfield Public Library podcast. I'm Dylan Zavagno, the Adult Services Coordinator at the library. Today, I have the enormous honor and privilege of sharing with you a conversation I had with Robert Pinsky, recorded on March 15th. The occasion is the publication of his new memoir, Jersey Breaks, Becoming an American Poet, published by Norton in October 2022. Robert Pinsky is a poet, essayist, translator, teacher, and speaker. He served as the three-time United States Poet Laureate from 1997 to 2000, during which time he founded the Favorite Poem Project. He is the author of the poetry collections In Order, Sadness and Happiness from 1975, An Explanation of America, 1979, History of My Heart, 1984, The Want Bone, 1990, The Figured Wheel New and Collected Poems, 96, Jersey Rain from 2000, Gulf Music, 2007, A Selected Poems Appeared in 2011, and most recently, At the Foundling Hospital from 2016. He's also the translator of the landmark best-selling The Inferno of Dante, and has written many other books about poetry, poetry anthologies, books on poetry making and reading, and poetry and culture. Robert is a professor of English and creative writing in the graduate program at Boston University. He's won many awards, made many public speeches and appearances, including being on The Simpsons and The Colbert Report. In the words of the New York Times Sunday Book Review, quote, no other living American poet, no other living American probably, has done so much to put poetry before the public eye. Jersey Breaks is Robert Pinsky's first memoir, and it's a fascinating thing because Pinsky is a poet for whom, including a kind of autobiography, obliquely or directly, in his poetry has always been important. But when you include everything, you get to include your questions about it too. So how does a poet both fill in and leave in the blanks of identity, life, and poetry that he discovered in attending to and enjoying the sounds and meanings of our language so intimately and publicly for so many years. Just a note that you'll hear Lisa reference, that's the poet Lisa Hyten, our co-director, co-founder of Queer Poem A Day, and a former student of Robert's. She was in on the Zoom call with us. I also left in a cell phone ring and Robert's cat climbing on his shoulders include everything, right? It's a great honor to get to say, here's my conversation with Robert Pinsky. So Robert, we're here to talk about Jersey Breaks And I love this book because I love your voice. And I think you became Poet Laureate when I was eight or nine years old. (laughs) And you would be spoken about in these, you know, hollowed tones by teachers. And we'd watch favorite poem project videos in class. And reading this book, I kept thinking, well, what do I mean by that, that I love Robert Pinsky's voice? Because... You write about in the sounds of poetry, I'm paraphrasing here, but that vocal reality, rhythm, tone, melody, it's too subtle to really describe, but we all know it, and we use it gracefully every day. And there are just certain rhythms in your voice that are very close to me and distinct. I thought we would start by having you read a little bit from Jersey Breaks. Sure. I wanted to have you read on page three the two little paragraphs there on the top of page three. Sure. I sometimes think with my ears and voice, putting music above meaning. It's a habit that has been my failing and my calling. Little Silver, Hazlitt, Perth Amboy, Ramboy, and Secaucus. Those were stops on the New York and Long Branch Railroad. I don't know much about those places, but the consonants and vowels of their names chanted by old school train conductors on the way to Penn Station from Long Branch made a familiar seductive music. My many aunts and uncles lived in Hoboken, Hackensack, Summit, 
Passaic, Hopewell, and the Oranges. Which family lived where, I don't remember, but those place names made a verbal harmony, a verbal harmony like what I found years later in 16th century lyrics by Thomas Campion and John Dowland. Thank you. I, I have to tell you, Robert, I've shared these two paragraphs with people, and it makes me cry when I think about this, partly because I know some people in the Oranges, so these names are uh -huh. also familiar to me, um, and the sounds themselves are delightful, and we could analyze them, but also that there's the suggestion that these sounds and these poets become more known to you than your family. And I wondered, um, because you also talk about in this book your first experience with great poetry being your half-Torah po portion, um, where you wouldn't understand yes. the what the meaning was of Isaiah, but I you heard I the, couldn't understand the words. what I was singing in my little pre adolescent voice was <laughs> uh, the uh, emptiness, how much God hates meaningless ritual. <laughs> well, and that's what I wonder with this passage is, is you say it's a failing and a calling, is paying attention to sounds maybe over family a distance that you have to the world? Art has a lot to do with childhood. People say, oh, I can't dance. I don't know how to dance. When you were three years old, you did. When you're two and three and four, you know how. Then somebody teaches you that you can't. Without learning, you would still be dancing and you would be playing ball. Sometimes people get discouraged, oh, I'm not an athlete, I'm not a jock. When you were little, you loved playing with the ball. And for me, that has a lot to do with poetry. Hackensack and Passaic and Hopewell and the Oranges, they're real to a child as sounds. Their poetry is meaningful. And then you have to get older where somebody tells you Hoboken is a Dutch word and Hackensack is a mispronunciation and distortion of a Lenny Lenape word. Uh, or the oranges have to do with the Dutch Reformed Church and a lot of other things worth knowing that we won't say, oh, well, that's no good. That's academic, that pejorative term. But for the child and for some emotional core in anybody, it's like dancing as an expression of how you feel and what you're hearing. The places are heard realities. They're auditory realities. It's, it's amazing. And I... I was also so moved in the book when you talked about Alice and the Fawn and loving yeah. this passage. Can you can you tell us about why you loved that? Um, I'll take the Tineal illustration. I have a copy of the Tineal illustration on my wall. Uh, Kids reread a lot. Certainly, I reread a lot. And I think for a certain year or two of my life, I was reading the Alice in Wonderland and through the Looking Glass books. Constantly, I was just reading them all the time. Sometimes right through and start over again. Sometimes just picking up in parts. And uh, the chapter of the wood where things have no names, very relevant really to our talking about Thomas Campion and Hoboken and <laughs> uh, Dowland and the Oranges, Alice and the Fawn, are intimate and they're very, they're together. They have that nice awkward embrace while they're in the wood where things have no names. Then it's rather similar, isn't it, to what I was saying about being taught. They get towards the end of the wood where things have no names. And Alice, this is so brilliant. She's pretty sure her name begins with an L. It begins with an L. <clears throat> which in a way it does. That's right, right. So, that's so much like memory. I mean, he was a genius at things like that. 
And she says, I, I think, I, and the fawn says, yes, I'm a fawn, and you're a human little girl. <laughs> so uh, that means the fawn has to dash away, and they're not, they're not embracing anymore. And uh, I think I say in that chapter, I think that's when I became a writer. Yeah. <clears throat> I loved the illustration that I just showed you. I love the story of the, them walking in the wood, th wood where things have no names. And it was like a movie. It was like a feature film in my mind. Then I go to it on the page one day. I can cover it with two fingers. It's just a couple of sentences. And I felt almost betrayed, certainly tricked. <laughs> and how, did, how do you do that? How do a few words make not just a scene, but a whole set of feelings that unfold the way a movie unfolds for an hour and a half? But it's only, it's less than a minute. It's a few seconds and such a big reality. And um, it is, uh, I mean, of course, you chose these things deliberately, Dylan, <laughs> but it is striking to me that liking the names that the conductor calls and then being also fascinated by the absence of names right. like fawn and little girl those those are related um and yeah it's it's just amazing to me i'm sure we'll circle back to that theme um but maybe getting at this idea of the creation of your voice and how we might describe it I was really blown away by how you talk about the title poem of your first book, Sadness and Happiness. Yes. Um, because I read an earlier interview from back in 1980 where ah. you said, oh, you know, I don't like that narrator that much. He's a little too self-involved. But now you come back and say, well, that really kind of was me. And you describe it um, as a meeting of Allen Ginsberg with the 16th century poet George Gascoigne, um, with the resisted model of Yeats, and it's both social and antisocial. But the the rhythm that I associate with you and your voice is already there in that poem. I think that Ginsburg and Gascoigne both helped me help me recognize a poetry this again goes back to childhood <laughs> a poetry that has to do with um, excited talking talking to yourself uh, a poetry that isn't necessarily orphic or imagistic it's poetry as Anybody at all would think of poetry, things you say when you're excited. The ideas of any given five years or 10 years, they're ideas. <laughs> and an idea that probably in my teens was around poetry was the objective correlative, where Eliot says the apparent, it's something like he says, the subject, or the experience is like a piece of meat. The poet is like a burglar who has a piece of meat for the consciousness is like a dog and the burglar distracts the dog of the consciousness of the reader to get at the uh, unconscious. Really interesting idea. I was struck by it. I accepted it. Hmm. And at some point, it was extremely encouraging to me to say, fuck it. I <laughs> reject the idea. Uh, um, I'll turn off my ringer. Uh, to just say, uh, you know, I don't... Uh, I, I like the consciousness. <laughs> I like the subject. And uh, all due respect to the metaphorical or imagistic piece of meat. I want to play with the dog. 
I want the dog to know that I'm there burgling. <laughs> and it was like the moment reading those poets, Ginsburg would be one, when I found that the English teacher wisdom that you don't talk about what the poet says, but what the speaker says. Right. It's a useful idea. It's a good idea. But there's something a little crazy about saying in Ben Johnson's poem on the death of my first son, <laughs> the speaker says, blah, 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 blah. Do you really suppose that Ben Johnson was only pretending to be the father of a seven-year-old named Benjamin who died? Um, so that the speaker becomes a, a pedantry. Uh, it's related to that. So we, we've been talking so far about voice and it's voice as a personal matter. And uh, it's everyone's voice. It's not voice as a, a marvelous performative instrument of Sir John Gilgood uh, or of, uh, of any actor. Well, Robert, I want to read you a quote from The Situation of Poetry because it connects exactly with what you're saying here. And you start by, you know, kind of relating with just what you were saying of like the modernists were kind of trying to be more imagistic than thou, <laughs> you say at one point. And that that's sort of a weird thing to do because language itself is general. And that words and the human soul both generalize. And that that's a tradition going back through all of poetry, whether it's um, Keats trying to talk to the nightingale or Wallace Stevens's snowman we're beholding. So here's the quote. Language is absolutely abstract, a web of concepts and patterns. And if one believes experience to consist of unique, ungeneralizable moments, then the gap between language and experience is absolute. But the pursuit of the goal or the effort to make that gap seem less than absolute has produced some of the most remarkable and moving poetry in the language. Naturally, it has produced much dross, too. My proposition is that the difference between the dross and vulgarization on the one hand and the genuine work on the other is a sense of cost, misgiving, and difficulty. And I read this as I was reading through all of your poetry in chronological order, and I thought, oh my gosh, because at one point you also call the gap a gulf, and the word gulf appears in your poetry yes. several times, and if you have a book called Gulf Music, which is completely appropriate to your project. And, you know, you've said your poetry is, um, again, in that 1980 interview with Mark Halliday, your poetry is all autobiographical. And we can see the boardwalks and the small people in the town of Long Beach that we learn about in the, the memoir here. But I wondered if including yourself in the poems more explicitly as the poetry went on, was part of closing or mapping that gap. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about when you insisted on keeping yourself in the poem, The Figured Wheel, <laughs> which you describe in the memoir, too. My name, yeah, The yeah. Poem, The Figured Wheel, has my name in it. I guess one of my purposes is to take, is to give, if I can, to poets like you and Lisa to poets younger than me, uh, a spirit of freedom, including freedom from whatever seems au courant, uh -huh. whatever seems what you have to keep up with. And uh, I think the childish not knowing any better is your ally that um, <clears throat> whenever you get the feeling there's something that is forbidden, a kind of language you mustn't use or something you shouldn't write about or something you must write about. Um, I mean, 
there in the 18th century imitating Virgil and the Geor Georgics, people wrote poems about all sorts of things. <laughs> the first, one of the first American poets, the first New Jersey poet, Philip Freneau, who was uh, sort of an employed journalist of Thomas Jefferson, Freneau wrote uh, basically a long essay against slavery, about why slavery was evil. And he did that in verses. I wish it were a great poem. It's not. <laughs> it's admirable. Uh, but, you know, if Virgil would write a poem giving good advice about beekeeping, what you do to keep bees, what you do with the honey, all of that. And uh, there's a freedom to that. Mm. Have that as a model. And... Um, A poem of mine that I was thinking about this morning as we were about to have this conversation about my autobiography uh, is uh, I, I wrote a poem called Window that was a kind of a parody of autobiography. Uh, oh, would a you parody read it to us? of the standard. This is my ethnic group. This is my region. I grew up here where all the people of this ethnicity uh, uh, did these jobs, and this was the address. And that's a great tradition in poetry. I'm not saying it's bullshit. It's not to be practiced. But it, too, can become a pedantry. And uh, in a way, I marvel at my nerve writing the poem. Uh, in a way, I'm, I, I, I want to read the poem to you Please. and Lisa, partly because there's the challenge of, is this forbidden? Or, as I try to consider in the book, is my separating myself from the autobiographical practice where I'd have to say, uh, I grew up in a New Jersey resort town. My parents were the children of Jewish immigrants. And part of me thinks, oh, that's boring. So the window remains what I said, the window to be born in a certain year, in a certain town in New Jersey, to certain parents of a certain social class, economic circumstances, professions. But the poem is a kind of parody of vivid writing. I think it was a time when everybody was writing their own version of the Lowell poems of life studies. Mm -hmm. And I knew how little I wanted to write one of those life studies poems identifying my tribe. My window, my rectangle, is what sex I am, what gender I am, my ethnicity, my region, my regional accent, all of that. But I can look out of the window, I hope. Window. <clears throat> Our building floated heavily through the cold. On shifts of steam, the raging coal-fed furnace poured forced from the boiler's hull, and showers of spark, the trolleys flashed careening under our cornice. My mother, Mary Beamish, who came from Cork, held me to see the snowfall out the window. Windhold, she sometimes said, as if in Irish it held wind out, or showed us the wind was old. Windhole in Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxon, Faces like brick, they worshipped Easter's rabbit, and mistletoe that was Thor's jism where thunder struck the oak. We took their language in our mouth and chewed. Some of the consonants drove us nearly crazy because we were Chinese. Or was that just the food my father brought from our restaurant downstairs? in the fells, by the falls, in the old ghetto or New Jersey, little Havana or little Russia, I forget, because 
the baby wasn't me, the way these words are not. Whoever she was teaching to talk, snow, she said, snow, and you opened your small brown fist and closed it and opened again to hold the reflection of torches and faces inside the window glass and through it, a cold black sheen of shapes and fires shaking, kitchen lights, flakes that crisped and crossed other lights in lush diagonals, the snow-charmed traffic surging and pausing, red, green, white, the motion of motes and torches that at her word you reached out for where you were. It was you, that bright confusion. And I guess that's my idea of what a human being is, is a bright confusion. At the time, I was living in Newton Corner, and I had a book called something like The Death of Newton Corner or The End of Newton Corner, because Newton Corner was this village neighborhood, and they put the Massachusetts Turnpike through it. Hmm. And in it, there was a picture of a woman in her 70s or 80s who had lived in Newton Corner since she came as an immigrant child from Ireland. Her name was Mary Beamish. There's a wonderful picture of her, an interview with her. And uh, I decided I would make Mary Beamish, I would adopt her as my mom in my poem. <laughs> <laughs> and once I dared to have an Irish mom, then I was free to think for a moment, wonder whether I was Chinese. Um, I think I chose to read that poem to you uh, in the context of having written an autobiography yeah. that by the rules of autobiography and by what I owe the reader does, does not play with the idea of my window, my circumstances. It fills it in. It tells you this right. is the pain, these are the dimensions, the right angles are here, it looks out in that direction, and so forth. I wanted to ask you, because this theme in Jersey Breaks is that things could have broken another way, both personally and nationally, um, I revere and love your book, An Explanation of America, your second book, and it has this discursive essayistic voice and brings in all of these references, Willa Cather's My Antonia, translation of Horace, the porno film Deep Throat, your daughter's in The Winter's Tale, um, and then Vietnam and a murder. But it all gets digested, and there's this theme in your work that what we think is the authentic is actually made up. So I'm going to read a quote from An Explanation of America. Because as all things have their explanations, true or false, all can come to seem domestic. The brick mills of New England on their rivers are brooding, classic. The iron horse is quaint, steel oil drums, musical. And the ugly suburban villas of London, Victorian Levitt towns, have come to be civilized and urbane, for place itself is always a kind of motion." And that's the same thing in your, you know, very famous poem, Shirt, the clan tartans invented by the mill owners yeah. um, to control the Scottish, the savage Scottish workers. Um, I, I guess my question is, as you're filling in this window, how do you leave room for that shifting place or guard against that nostalgia of it kind of circling back into... Um, a pedantry, as you say. You have to question everything. Uh, I'm very happy to say that yesterday I got the uh, the sort of newsletter email from Arrowsmith, the magazine published by uh, Oscar Melnichuk, and there was a very nice review of Jersey Breaks, very good review. Hmm. Uh, and the headline of the review is two words, that in a way summarize what you were just saying <clears throat> about explanation for America. Uh, the reviewer, John Okrent, titles of the review, include everything. Include everything 
yeah, that could be a slogan for me. I know I decided at some point that uh, with all respect for epigraphs, if you want an epigraph, if it's important, put it in the poem. Quote it in the poem. Huh. Why should only prose writers be entitled to include quotations? <laughs> and great poets have done it. So why not do it? And then from include everything, then I get to question everything. It's the kind of uh, universalist, um, all-embracing, inclusive attitude I'm describing to you. Is that just one more cultural trait? Is that what secular Jews of my generation would do? And yes, in a way it is. So therefore, at least question it a bit. Yeah. Decide um, how much it, it can risk becoming automatic. One of the things that also stunned me in trying to figure out your voice, which relates to what you were just saying, is how collaborative it is and that you're even questioning your own methods sometimes. So I loved the story of... Um, you in a Berkeley living room with Bob Haas and Louise Glick challenging each other to write poems unlike... Out of so, character, yeah. Right, so um, <laughs> Bob, who is sort of California Buddhist, had to write a Roman Catholic poem, right? Yeah, he grew up a Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> he grew up, grew up in the church, so he said, well, you're, and you're one of the few Catholic a, writers had to write, a, oh, had to write ahead, something yeah. funny. Right. <laughs> Which she did. She wrote a poem about Bob and me talking to one another. And <clears throat> what did you have to write? <laughs> I think I had to write something that stayed in one place. Right. <laughs> one image, something like that. Exactly. There's, And it's also, I was also very intrigued by hearing about your translation of The Inferno and calling up Frank Bedart to talk through the different things because, you know, he's somebody who also has a very distinctive reading voice. His yes. poetic voice is all about that voice. Um, and I listened to the audio production of it where Frank is one of the readers and yeah. I couldn't get over, um, you know, nobody else would translate it this way. I, ch I checked other translations, but it's so great. <laughs> the way you would combine these very kind of Americana words with this rhythm. So I'm just going to read the opening of Canto 23. Silent, alone, sans escort, with one behind and one before, as friars minor use, we journeyed. The present fracas turned my mind to Aesop's fable of the frog and mouse. Yeah. He was writing... He was writing poetry about final things in the Vulgate, in the language that was not Latin or Greek. <clears throat> and he was, I mean, the, the Commedia was indexed, was forbidden by the Catholic Church for a good while. <clears throat> and he was combining all kinds of things. It is a very glorious, perhaps the most glorious mishmash ever created it puts together a lot of different kinds of things and um <clears throat> that audio version of the poem you know the readers are frank seamus heaney louise glick and me and i can understand why some people would find it ridiculous because we rotate <clears throat> and each reader sounds exactly like that reader. I like that, and I think that is partly a triumph of uh, Dante. Mm. Here's this language that from his time has evolved so far, is so different. Um, I say in Jersey Breaks that I love David Rivard's when he reviewed the Inferno of Dante, he in those first lines where I say, uh, midway in our life's journey, I found myself in dark woods, the right road lost. 
<laughs> and he says, right road lost. Sounds like a Dennis Johnson blues yeah. song. And um, I like that because to me, it also sounds like Dante's extremely compact, very efficient, almost often terse uh, Italian. And uh, the English that evolved from slave chants and the blues and from Ernest Hemingway's super refinement of sentences that he liked in who knows, Anderson, other places, Twain. Um, culture to be alive, you know, it keeps changing. Like in that quotation out about place, place is always a form of motion. Mm. Any town, any building, any house, you know, this, I'm looking at the images behind me of this 19th century uh, uh, post-Civil War house that I live in now. And the radiator is probably from the 20s. My Victorian chair is probably also from the 20s. Behind it, there's a, a keyboard made in Japan a couple of years ago. And, you know, etc. And it's not the place, the room is not the room it was 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 years ago. It keeps moving. And uh, I'm going to die and move out. And somebody else will come into this room. It'll be entirely different. Except it'll only be an entirely different 78 and a half percent or 23 and a quarter percent. And some of it will still be the room of the guy named Stevens, who was some kind of minor official in the town of Cambridge, uh -huh. and I think had fought in the Civil War. Wow. He's partly still here. So I think um, I want to hear another section from Jersey Breaks. And I want to introduce it here. It's I, I'm going to ask you to read page 180 and 181, which finishes with the end of your poem, um, History of My Heart. Um, but I have to tell you, Robert, that I remember seeing the Simpsons episode you were on in 2002, and I would have been 12 or 13, I think. And I was a poetry-starved young person. <laughs> And there you were funny and charming and self-deprecating and joking um, as poet laureate, um, you know, joking that the president would say, Pinsky, where's my poem? <laughs> and you yeah. would say, well, I thought it was due Tuesday and I was just pulling stuff out of my ass. Yeah. But Lisa's in a, Lisa Simpson is in a coffee shop and she's so excited to hear you read Impossible to Tell. And I thought, well, Lisa Simpson knows this poem. I have to know this poem. <laughs> And the, they're flashing these words on the screen, animating them. Slow dulcimer, gavotte and bow in autumn, Bashot and his friends go out to view the moon in summer, gasoline rainbow in the gutter, the secret courtesy that courses like ichor through the old form of the rude full-scale joke impossible to tell in writing. I had never heard somebody use the phrase gasoline rainbow. It, I saw it everywhere. This made me want to write. And the way that TV shows are watched over and over again and become songs to children, you became part of that background for me. And then in the memoir, you reveal this other section that you flew out to record that episode from Boston to L.A. on September 10th, 2001. I mean, same flight number as the American flight that went down, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that it was all – the poem is about – it's a poem about jokes that's about a friend dying of a tragic accident. And then you have this national tragedy happening, and somehow you weave this all together with the idea of including autobiography in a poem. So I just thought I could ask you to read page 180 to 181. <laughs> Yeah, well, every everything includes everything, yeah. like it or not. And uh, isn't it uh, 
just like life, that uh, that image of gasoline rainbow in a gutter. Somebody who's in kindergarten now, if they read that poem, they would need a footnote when they're your age, let alone my age, because the gasoline cars will be gone. And they already probably don't uh, pollute the gutter water as much as they did when you and I were kids. Uh, so that that familiar image of the spectrum reflected in the oily water where a car has been dribbling, uh, that is going to become like somebody needing to read about the pastern of a horse in the 18th century or some other quite arcane uh, reference. Uh, so when you try to allude to the ordinary, uh, you have to also understand that for somebody, it's going to become arcane and extraordinary. Okay, page 180. In Louis Malle's movie, Atlantic City, Burt Lancaster, playing an elderly, small-time New Jersey gangster, says to a younger man, quote, the Atlantic Ocean was something then. You should have seen the Atlantic Ocean in those days, end quote. What are years? <clears throat> what is the wounded Atlantic Ocean these days? What is there to say about the abandoned house? What are the poetry bro guys of the Simpsons episode supposed to be thinking with words from impossible to tell painted on their bare chests? What are we to make of the hijacked flights, the religious fanatics and all those deaths, including the passengers who somehow brought the hijacked flight 93 down to crash in rural Pennsylvania instead of the capital in Washington? What is laughter? What are tears? The poetry answer, or the poetry way of putting the question, is like my joke of a battle cry or heraldic motto, all of the above. A decade after sadness and happiness with its jittering headlong jumps from woodmanship to baseball hits and errors on Central Square in history of my heart, I tried to include laughter and music, desire and catastrophe in a less frantic kind of movement than sadness and happiness. The manic inclusiveness, the why not drive toward all of the above persists. But the later title poem, History of My Heart, is more explicit and linear, candid about my mother's brain injury, and maybe less like my own transient ischemic attack years later. And then you want me to read the quotation from the poem? I would love it. <laughs> Shrill flutes, oboes, and cymbals of doom my poor mother fell, and after the accident, loud noises and bright lights hurt her and heights. She went downstairs backwards, sometimes with one arm on my small brother's shoulder. Over the years, she got better, but I was lost in music, the cold brazen bow of the saxophone. Its weight at thumb, neck, and lip came to a blood-warm life like Italo's flashlight in the hand. In a white jacket and pants with a satin stripe, I aspired to the roughneck elegance of my grandfather, Dave. Sometimes, playing the horn in a bar or at a high school dance, I felt my heart following after a capacious form, sexual and abstract, in the thunk, thrum, thrum, come wallow, and then a little screen of quicker notes, boosting to a fifth higher, winging to clang wump of a major seventh. Listen to me, listen to me, the heart says in reprise, until sometimes in the course of giving itself, it flows out of itself all the way across the air, in a music piercing as the kids at the beach calling from the water, look, look at me, to their mothers, but out of itself, into the listener, the way feeling pretty or full of erotic reverie makes the one who feels seem beautiful to the beholder witnessing the idea of the giving of desire, nothing more wanted than the little singing notes 
of wanting, the heart yearning further into giving itself into the air, breath strained into song, emptying the golden bell it comes from, the pure source poured altogether out and away. Wow. I, you know, when I read that poem first, it's stunning the way that your your mother's brain injury enters. And then in the memoir, there's also a stunning moment where, oh, Robert Pinsky had this minor stroke here. Um, how do you decide to to drop those moments into either your poetry or the memoir? I guess that the, the headline of the Arrows of the Rue include everything. Yeah. It implies include everything that you find yourself thinking about quite a lot. And sometimes one thing kind of heals or counters another. I mean, the painful mother memory of my mother's concussion, the years of those crazy symptoms, um, somehow leads me to the saxophone and it's probably one of the best things I ever wrote was just that nothing more wanted than the little singing notes of wanting. Yeah. That, um, that feeling pretty, feeling desirous makes a person desirable. And that erotic principle, nothing more wanted than the little singing notes of wanting um, like the concussion, it involves the body, it's mysterious, and you can't help thinking about it. If you can't help thinking about it, perhaps you ought to write about it. Perhaps you ought to include it. And, and pour it all out in a way and share it because you've, you've been seen and you, you can be. Um, I thought I would ask you to read another poem, um, which tells some of the stories from the memoir, and that's the poem Creel from your most recent collection in 2016 at the Foundling Hospital. With any luck, I'll read this without a cat on my head. <laughs> Creel, I'm tired of the gods. I'm pious about the ancestors, afloat in the wake widening behind me in time, those restive divisors. My father had one job from high school till he got fired at 30. The year was 1947, and his boss, planning to run for mayor, wanted to hire an Italian veteran, he explained, putting it in plain English. I was seven years old. My sister was too. The barbarian tribes in the woods were so savage, the empire had to conquer them to protect and clear its perimeter. So into the woods, Rome sent out missions of civilizing governors and forces to establish schools, courts, garrisons. Soldiers, clerks, priests, citizens with their household slaves. Years, decades, entire lives were spent in those hinterlands, which might be a good place to retire on a government pension, especially if in your work years you had acquired a native wife. Often I get these things wrong, or at best mixed up, but I do feel piety toward those persistent mixed families in Gaul, Britain, Thrace. When I die, may I take my place in the wedge widening and churning in the mortal ocean of years of souls. The Roman colonizing and mixing, the imperial processes of legal enslaving and freeing, involved not just the inevitable fucking in all senses of the word, but also marriages and births as developers and barbers, scribes and thugs, mingled and coupled with the native people 
and peoples. Begetting and trading, they had to swap, blend, and improvise languages. Couples, especially, needed to invent French, Spanish, German, those Creole languages. And I confess, Roman, barbarian, I find that Creole work more glorious than God. The way it happened, the school sent around a notice. Anybody interested in becoming an apprentice optician, raise your hand. It was the Great Depression. Anything about a job sounded good to Milford Pinsky, who told me he thought it meant a kind of dentistry. Anyway, he was bored sitting in study hall, so he raised his hand, and he got the job, as was his destiny, full time once he graduated. Joe Chavon was the veteran who took the job, not a bad guy. Dr. Weinberg did get elected mayor. Joe worked for him for years. At the bank, John Smock, an Episcopalian whose family once owned the bank, had played sports with Milford and he gave him a small loan with no collateral. So he opened his own shop, grinding lenses and selling glasses, as his mother-in-law is said, almost a professional. Optician comes from a Greek word that has to do with seeing. Banker comes from an Italian word for a bench where people sat to make loans or change. Pinsky, like Tex or Brooklyn, is a name nobody would have if they were still in that same place. Those names all signify someone who's been away from home a while. Schiavone means a Slav or slave. Milford is a variant on the poet's names. Milton, Herbert, Sidney. Certain immigrants used to give their offspring. Creole comes from a word meaning to breed or to create in a place. Well, I think it connects to so many things we've been talking about. Um, part of it is the messiness. I'll, I'll just briefly mention that I love in the memoir your ambivalence about being seen as a poetry promoter with the favorite poem project that I, I think sometimes in the anthologies and in, um, you know, the sound of poetry, you're saying, well, this is what can be said about a poem, but you're also trying to leave room for what cannot be said about a poem. That the and, most important things yeah. are either there or not, and they defy explanation. Well, and then what's, unbelievable to me in the memoir is when you talk about being inspired by Yeats's sailing to Byzantium. Yes. And you say that Yeats's artifice of eternity stunned you with its final assurance to include everything, what is past or passing or to come, and that this allowed you... Um, here, I'll read this sentence. In the poem that entered my memory, unwilled, I heard its happy authority, a grace beyond anything I found in the two great religions, Christianity yeah. or Judaism, that might have influenced you. Now, that poem asserts a kind of eternity. Your work, as we've been talking about, is saying the place is always changing. Um, how, how does the, the inspiration turn into the the, the messier thing. <laughs> Once out of nature, meaning when he dies or when he makes something that's not bound by the laws of physics or biology, once out of nature, I will never take my bodily form from any natural thing. But such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enameling to keep a drowsy emperor awake. That's Daffy. <laughs> a little mechanical bird to keep a drowsy emperor awake. You call Yates goofy. I love that. <laughs> or... 
or sit upon a golden bough to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium. So it's been this, as I say, daffy, weird. That's what you think your life's work is, is a mechanical bird that goes tweet, tweet? Or sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past and passing and to come. Everything <laughs> that this, and in a way he's saying, my tweeting here, these rhymes in this demanding rhyme scheme, it's the most capacious thing you ever saw, reader, whether you know it or not. It can take in anything. In including its absence or its death. Yeah. Um, I thought we would end by having you read the poem Jersey Rain because the title Jersey Breaks is so interesting. Lisa pointed out to me, well, breaks is active now. <laughs> and there's so many implications. It's the break of the waves behind yes. you. It's line breaks. It's, you know, give me a break in the epigraph. Um, as a folk saying, gives someone a, a, a sense of, you know, fortune or good luck. Um, but I, the poem Jersey Rain also has some of the, the familiar sounds that we began with. Yeah, sure. I'm, uh, I'll do that. Jersey Rain. <laughs> I believe this is part of the show I did with Bruce Springsteen. I think we do it together. We do alternate lines on it. Um, I have to Jersey say the... Uh, oh, sorry to interrupt, but the... The blurb on the cover of this memoir, Bruce Springsteen, it says, truly the voice of the Jersey Shore. <laughs> <laughs> Jersey rain. Now near the end of the middle stretch of road, what have I learned? Some earthly wiles and art. That often I cannot tell good fortune from bad that once had seemed so easy to tell apart. The source of art and woe, a slant in wind, dissolves or nourishes everything it touches. What road bank gullies and ruts it doesn't mend, it carves the deeper, boiling, tawny in ditches. It spins itself regardless into the ocean. It stains and scours and makes things dark or bright. Sweat of the moon, a shroud of benediction, the chilly liquefaction of day to night. The Jersey rain, my rain, soaks all as one. It smites Metuchen, Rahway, Saddle River, Fair Haven, Newark, Little Silver, Bayonne. I feel it churning even in fair weather to craze distinction, dry the same as wet. In ripples of heat, the August drought still feeds vapors in the sky that swell to drench my state. The Jersey rain, my rain, in streams and beads of indissoluble grudge and aspiration. Original milk, replenisher of grief descending destroyer arrowed source of passion silver and black executioner font of life it, it's amazing robert i i'm just so grateful for your time and and for your work thank you for the attention dylan it's high grade attention and i appreciate it You can check out Jersey Breaks, Becoming an American Poet, and other books by Robert Pinsky here at the library, or check out his website, robertpinskypoet.com. The library is hosting a favorite poem project reading on Thursday, June 1st at 7 p.m. These are wonderful events started by Robert Pinsky, where the community reads to each other, sharing the poems they hold dear. If you'd like to be a reader at the event, please email me at favoritepoem at deerfieldlibrary.org with a favorite poem and why you'd like to read it. 
The only rule is it must be a published poem not written by you or a friend or family member. The idea being to show how vital poetry already is in America. You can also register to attend as just an audience member. There are links to sign up in the show notes and blog post. That's our show. Thank you so much to Robert Pinsky and to Annette Frost with The Favorite Poem Project and to our dear Lisa Hyten for helping coordinate this conversation. And thank you for listening to our 60th interview episode. Comments and feedback are always welcome and can be sent to podcast at deerfieldlibrary.org. Go to deerfieldlibrary.org slash podcast to learn more about our show and find links to subscribe. You can also follow the library on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or check out our YouTube channel. Links are on our website and in our show notes. We'll be back next month with Queer Poem A Day. Thanks for listening. <laughs>